the upcoming Parsha is called Vayakhel, right? And last week's Parsha, we had the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. And, uh, and Moshe had punished everybody, right? the, the Jew, the God had punished everybody, the Jewish people had sinned, and now they're, they're trying to heal. And so what does Moshe do? Oh, I have a, a text for you to, to read along with. In the first Pasuk, Moshe calls the whole community together, right, uh, to tell them, okay, here's what Hashem is going to tell you to do. Ah, we have another okay. customer. Okay. okay. So, um, hello, perfect timing, we just started. So, um, right, so talking about Parshas Vayakil, Moshe assembled everybody together, and he tells, he's about to tell them, um, what Hashem wants of them after the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. So this is the day after Yom Kippur, by the way, because the chronology goes like this. Um, uh, remember, he went up first, the first time he went up to get the first tablets, that was for 40 days. He stayed there 40 days, and he comes down the mountain. He sees the Jewish people sitting with the golden calf. He breaks the tablets. The very next day, and, pun and the, the Jewish people die, 3,000 of them. He goes, the next day he goes back up the mountain to pray for God to forgive the Jewish people. He stays up there another 40 days, and then he comes back down, okay? Then he, he comes back down to, to make the tablets, and then he takes the second set of tablets up the mountain again for a third set of 40 days, and he's uh, going to have, Hashem is going to write on the tablets with this, the second set of commandments, and then he comes back down the mountain for the final time on Yom Kippur with the second set of tablets. And Yom Kippur is the day when the Jewish people are finally forgiven for the sin of the golden calf. That's the chronology of it. So so now it's what, it was the day after Yom Kippur. He gathers them together here, as in, it says in verse 1. And the first thing he tells them about is Shabbos. Six days' work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have sanctity, a day of complete rest of the Lord. Whoever performs work on this day shall be put to death. So you could have a question here, uh, right? Why would Moshe start telling them about Shabbos? This is after the golden calf, right? They're in this, the state of mind is, you know, contrition and, and horror at what they did. They, they, they're, they're broken, you know, they're spiritually, uh, it's a difficult uh, uh, time there. They, they just did a set of idolatry. You would think that logically what Moshe would start with would be something a little bit more on the spiritual realm, right? Uh, the, the oneness of Hashem, um, how to connect to Hashem, theology, monotheism, you know, things like that. But he starts with something very practical, very, here's the law, here's Shabbos. And so the question is, why would you do that? And I think here the, the theme of Judaism is repeated. What we find all, over and over again is that Judaism is all about the doing. Right? We're not about the meditation. We're not about the communion, uh, the spiritual communion. Of course, that's part of it, but our, our, we get meaning from Judy, from our religion, from doing, from the mitzvos, from engaging in our day-to-day -day lives with the mitzvos. And, and that's what guarantees uh, the, the continuation of the, the, is the Jewish nation, right? And so that's why he's starting with this, I think. And then he t the next thing he tells them is about the Mishkan. So then, you know, we always, because uh, uh, right away after that in verse 4 um, and 5, he starts telling them about what's required, the materials required. He's asking everybody to come and donate all kinds of materials. We'll get to what they are in a minute. So the, again, we, we always, uh, whenever the Torah puts two sort of subjects together, we always like to ask why. What's the connection? Why would the Torah, the Torah follow Shabbos with Mishkan? What's the connection? So you might say one, one connection between Shabbos and the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is that they're, they're both very similar kinds of things. In that, the Mishkan is a dwelling for Hashem on earth. That's the purpose of it. It's where we connect to him. It was where the Jewish people would go to, to have their, most, their closest connection to him when they wanted to atone for a sin. They would go to the, the Mishkan and sacrifice an animal or give some other kind of sacrifice. It was where Moshe went to speak to Hashem in the Kodesh Kedashim, in the Holy of Holies. So it's the place where on earth, it's this Hashem said, this is going to be my home on earth. 
In a similar way, you could say that Shabbos is a home on earth, for Hashem, a home in time rather than place, right? Shabbos is a sanctification, a day where we are saying, this is going to be dedicated to Hashem, right? So um, we, it, it, we, it's a day when we restore ourselves and our neshamos, our, our souls, and it's also a day where we're supposed to reconnect Hashem. We basically are saying, by, by stopping work, we're saying, Hashem is the, is the sovereign, He's in charge of the world. I am acknowledging that by not doing any work that, that of creation, as it were, right? And it's a sanctuary for Hashem on this day because on the day that I'm giving up work and I'm, I'm restoring my soul, I'm feeding my body and my soul with all the finest things, I'm able to say this day is, I'm letting Hashem back into my life, as it were. So it's a similar kind of, uh, kind of thing. Um, okay, another uh, reason why the two subjects are connected, Shabbos and the Tabernacle, is that the Jews have to be careful about not violating the Shabbos in order to build the Mishkan. They might think, oh, it's such an important job that I have to continue working on Shabbos. No, the Torah is saying no. But also, the, the Talmud gives us another reason for the juxtaposition. The juxtaposition is that to teach us that those jobs that are involved in constructing the Mishkan are the very jobs we're not allowed to do on Shabbos, right? There are 39 categories of what we call malachos, works, or um, acts of work, that were involved in the construction of the tabernacle. For example, sewing, you know, they sewed the curtains, right? So we are not allowed to sew on Shabbos. So whatever those cat 39 categories of work were for the, for the Mishkan, those are the very things we're not allowed to do on Shabbos. So those are connected. So those 39, the work that we did for the Mishkan is paralleled in the work we're not allowed to do for, for Shabbos, right? So now why those elements of work, uh, why should those be outlawed? Uh, the Kabbalists explain that all the types of work involved in the Mishkan involved some sort of Bria, creation work, that were reflected or paralleled in what Hashem did in the first six days of creation, Okay. So uh, cooking, for example, I mean, I didn't, God, God didn't cook, for, uh, but, but starting a fire. And there was some, there was some element of creation, creationism. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a little bit here and there because I just have a lot of material to cover today. And I want to spend most of the time on the, the topic of the women in this parasha because we have some interesting, interesting points to, to point out. Okay, um, in verse 2, it's a, there's an interesting thing I want to point out. It says, yamim ta'asem lacha. Six days, the, the translation here, I do not like. It, the actual tra the translation is six days, sheishas yamim ta'ase melacha. You will work. Ta'ase, you shall work. Right. So you might ask the question, why is it necessary to say you will work? Right. All you have to really say is the seventh day you can't work. Right. But it seems to be, you know emphasizing here that you you will work on on the sixth day so why was it necessary to say that um, the message being expressed here is that and I'll explain how we get to it here is the message is that it's not Shabbos is not just a day to relax remember what the point of the day is the point of the day is to reconnect to your soul's source okay um, to restore your soul so we're told uh, the message tells about a dialogue that the Torah had had you want me to stop? No, we'll wait. Okay. The the Torah had a dialogue with Hashem, and the Torah, when it was given, complained to Hashem. He said, "It said, now that the Jews are in the desert and don't have any other concern, they can sit and study. It's great. But once they go to Eretz Yisrael and they settle the land, they're going to be busy all week with their work. They won't have time to study me." The Torah said. So what will happen then? So, so they were a little concerned. Hashem said, don't worry, I've given them a full day of the week that they're dedicated to you, Torah. And the Torah was appeased. So that's why it specifies six days of the work, uh, that you will work six days. Because if you're going to use the excuse of not studying Torah during the week, that, oh, I'm so busy, I'm working during the week, I'm working during the week, well, on Shabbos, you don't have that excuse. So it can't be just the day to disengage from work. It has to be a day you recognize that if you're gonna if you're gonna work six days, fine. You have, you're not gonna have time for Torah during the week, fine. 
Don't forget, Shabbos is the day to focus on Torah and holy things. Do you want to say something? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the next thing he tells them about, as I said, is to make donations to the tabernacle. Now, um, the name of the parsha, Vayakel, refers to this, to Moshe assembling, right? Vayakel means, Vayakel Moshe, Moshe assembled. He gathered together all of the Jewish people, okay? And it, it, we know that word in its form, uh, its noun form, kehillah. Kehillah means a congregation, right? A grouping of, Jewish, of, of people. And the word is very significant as a corrective to the events of the last parsha, the golden calf, right? So Kehillah means a community. A Kehillah is a group of people that is gathered together for some purpose, a collective undertaking. Now it can be a constructive purpose and it can be a, uh, a, a destructive purpose, right? Uh, a Kehillah that is organized for a destructive purpose can become a rabble, can become a crowd, a mob, right? This is the danger of just getting together for a negative, destructive purpose. Now, the, this word here, vayakel, the, the same word that, that here indicates getting together for some purpose, also appeared in last week's Parsha at the beginning of the problem, when it said, when the people saw that Moses was long and coming down the mountain, they gathered vayakahel around Aharon. So we have the same concept there, that there was a gathering of people in the last parsha. That gathering of, of people, what did they want? They wanted a god, right? A god or, or a leader in place of Moshe. So in that situation, they gathered for bad purposes, right? When Moshe came down the mountain, he saw that this gathering, Kehillah, had led to a wild mob. It says that Moshe saw the people running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control. So. So just as the sin involved people, individuals gathering together for a nefarious purpose, right? So the atonement for it has to be achieved by their, some corrective that has a similar kind of theme. In this case, gathering together as a kila, as, a, as, an, as an organized group, to make a home for the divine presence, right? That's what Moshe's idea here is. You're, you are, you once assembled together for bad, now I'm going to get you together. I'm going to bring you all together as a kehillah, and you're going to correct that that mob mentality with a group positive group mentality, right? How does he do that? At this point, you know these people are totally demoralized, right? They're broken. How? That's the challenge he's facing. So he does something fascinating. Now he doesn't. He doesn't initially. He opposed them. He came down, and there was fire and brimstone, and he throws the tablets down and. And he, he makes them drink a deadly drink and he kills the rest. I mean, you know, it was, it was all, no, you, what you're doing is wrong. Um, and again, at that point, so, so here, right, here he does something completely different. Here what he's going to do is he's going to use the same motivation that, that initially motivated them in the first place with the golden calf. Meaning they, want to band, they wanted to band together to accomplish something as a group. They were desperate to contribute something in order that they should create a god or a leader. Moshe is now appealing to that same sense in them, in the individuals who are wanting to donate, right? They wanted to give of themselves. They wanted to, to create something from among themselves. Well, Moshe is saying, okay, let's use that emotion. Let's use that initiative. Let's do something positive with it. Let's contribute for the Mishkan, right? So, uh, and the difference here again is that they're now acting in accordance with what God wants. God wants them to contribute to something positive, to, to making a home for him in, uh, in the Mishkan. So, uh, so when, so that's why Moshe is emphasizing here that everyone has something different to give. It says, um, Take from what you have, an offering to God, in, in, in the fifth Pasuk. Whatever you want, take from what you want. In other words, let's take the sep every separate individual has something to offer. Um, in the past, you, 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 you brought your own gifts, but you, 
contributed to making together with the group something bad. Well, let's do the opposite. Let's get, let's you know take what you want um, from the individuals and then come together as a group, right? So and then he tells them what they uh, so so he's trying to undo basically in the same with the same methodology trying to undo the, the the evil from before. So what do they what is what does Hashem want? So then the next few psukim we have what what Moshe is asking for, what Hashem is asking for. Gold, silver, copper, purple, blue, crimson wool, linen, goat hair, ram skins, tachash skins, acacia wood, oil, spices, and precious stones. Okay, so he's telling them um, everyone should just bring whatever they want. Whatever they want, they should bring, right? Get them together to undertake a task they can achieve only together, right? Because this is a, a task that has to be uh, a communal wide event. You can't have half half the people doing it and half the people not doing it. Everyone has to contribute so that they feel they're a team. And so he's team building here. That's what he's doing. They have to be able to feel like I had a hand in this. I had a part in this because that is the way you build a team. When every person contributes something to to a greater good, to a greater plan, and at the end of the plan, you, you, you're able to look at this finished product and go, I contributed, so I, I had a, a part, I'm important in this, and we all did, we all had the same thing. So he knew that, that in order to create a, a, a team, you have to create a team that builds something, create something. Now, remember that it was the Eir of Rav last week, the mixed multitudes in Egypt, that had caused the sin, right? That was what, that was what we said, that they, they were basically the instigators of the Eir of Rav, means mixed multitude. And these were the Egyptian people. Yeah. yeah. This were, this was a Rav means like a head of the synagogue and Arab means night. <laughs> yes, so Arab does mean night. And I explained last week how Arab Rav can mean great evening, which indicated because these were sorcerers, uh, some of them were sorcerers. And they had their greatest power in the time of the day oh, okay. called the Great Evening. But but generally speaking, the name also means um, uh, Rav means a multitude, okay, a, a large grouping of people. And this was the, a group of Egyptian people that wanted to leave and left with the with the Jewish people when the Jewish people left Egypt. God did not want them to come. Moshe wanted them. <laughs> Moshe had compassion on them. He said, "Okay, look, Hashem." They want to join our, our nation. Let, let's let them join. Them. And so Hashem said, fine, fine. But they caused problems all throughout this, this journey in the desert. For all 40 years, they made trouble. They made trouble here. They made trouble with the, with the, the spies. And it was not a pretty sight. So, Hash, so here, so Moshe realized that the Erevah was the instigator. So here, he didn't want to involve them in this. So that's why it says, collect among this yourselves. Was a, this was a special this was the Egyptian, oh, Egyptian. converts. They weren't yet con they weren't yet converts, but this was the Egyptian uh, a, a group of Egyptian people that left. As my husband explained it last week, they wanted to be on the winning team. <laughs> they wanted to be with the winners. They didn't want to be with the losers. The losers were the Egyptians. They didn't want they didn't want any part of that. They just wanted to be part of the Jews. So Moshe specifies take from among yourselves, meaning. He is, he's not speaking to the mixed multitude. Um, before the sin of the golden calf, God had commanded Moshe to take gifts from everyone. As it says, they shall take from me an elevated offering from every man. However, after the golden calf, Moshe is only talking to the Jewish people here. The women are included in this group that he's talking to. He wants donations from everyone, right? Um, again, the language here is take from among yourselves, meaning... Each person should just look inside their heart and whatever donation they want to give, that's what should be given. Nobody should be forced, right? Nobody should feel they have to give more because their neighbor is giving more. They Just whatever they want to do, okay? Um, and this is shown, this, the, 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 another way of achieving this, by the way, that's what I meant, another way of achieving this that everybody should just give exactly what their heart desires, is that they all left at, at verse, let's see, verse 20? Right. Verse 20, it says the entire community departed. They all left, meaning 
so that they left because they wanted to make their donations in private. And again, this is because they didn't, Hashem didn't want them to be forced to feel like, well, um, I'll, you know, if everyone brings at the same time, what happens? Some people bring more because they want to show off. Some people being more because they're ashamed. and They don't really have that much, but they don't want to look, you know, they want to keep up with the Joneses. What? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Hashem didn't want them to feel, Moshe didn't want them to feel, and they didn't want to feel like they had to outdo one another. So they all left, and then they would privately bring what they wanted, and that would be a true gift from their heart because it was only what they wanted to bring. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so therefore they leave and, and then they individually make their uh, donations. Okay, we come to a very interesting part in verse 28 and 20, 27 and 28. A very interesting um, gift. We're told, we single out here the princes. 27, verse 27 it says, And the princes brought the shoham stones and filling stones for the aphod and the choshen. So remember we said... Uh, and they and they brought also the spice and the oil for lighting. So remember, we said the 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 breastplate is the choshen, right? And the aphod, the apron. They had so the the breastplate had this, those precious stones, and the aphod had also two more precious stones. So that's what the nesim is the Hebrew word for the princes of the tribes. The nesim there were twelve uh, princes, uh, as as they're called, leaders, basically leaders of the tribes. And that's what they brought. Now, there's a very interesting, you know, we, we say whenever the Torah, you know, how, how things are spelled in the Torah is important. Sometimes a, word, a letter is left out, that's important. Sometimes a letter is put in, that's important. We always like to look at the meaning behind why the Torah writes the verses a certain way. Well, here, if you look at the Pasuk 27, Chavzayin, it spells Nesim without a Yud. So that's that's significant because the seam is usually spelled with a yud. So ne ne yeah with a nun na na seam without a yud na seam. So we're told that the nasim were blameworthy here because of the way they gave their gifts. So how did they give their gifts? Everybody else rushed to bring things. The nasim said. We're not going to bring, we'll make up whatever's missing. In other words, Moshe, whatever you need after everybody else brings their stuff, come to us. We'll give you whatever you need after that. So their mistake, what happened, what ended up happening was that nothing was missing because so much was brought to the point where Moshe had to say, enough, I can't use any more. That's enough. Their mistake was in thinking that they would there would be a shortfall. There was no shortfall. Everything was brought already except for the stones here, and, which is, are valuable, of course, and the spices and the oil, which is, it just wasn't a huge gift, right? Now, they acted, why did they act this way? So, so the Midrash tells us, why did the Nasim only bring gemstones and inlay stones at the end? Because when Moshe said, everyone... Whose heart, who is generous of heart, shall bring it as a gift for Hashem, the Nasim, the princes were upset. They were insulted. They were not happy that Moshe didn't come to them first because they figured like this. They had not been involved in the sin of the golden calf. The rest of the Jewish people were, and they somehow weren't. I'm not sure exactly what that means since only 3,000 people actually sinned anyway in the golden calf. But I guess they considered that they, their hearts were pure. They were against it, or somehow they felt they had distinguished themselves, and they did not act in the sin of the golden calf. And so, therefore, they hoped, they expected, that Hashem would want the first contributions for the Mishkan to be from them. Pure, right? No taint of sin. All the other Jewish people had a taint of sin. So when Moshe addressed all the Jewish people in general, and didn't come first to see him. The Nesim were insulted, and they felt that they should. Moshe should have said, have commanded them alone to build the Mishkan, right? Okay. And so, therefore, since they had not been forthcoming first with gifts, because they said, "Well, we're going to wait," they had been a little bit lax because of their pride, 
As punishment, Hashem took away a Yud from their name. A Yud is one of the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, the name of Hashem. Yud, K, Vav, K, right? And he took it out, took that Yud out to teach us about pride, to say this was the wrong way to do it. It's the wrong, wrong way. And the Midrash continues, Hashem is speaking, of my children who made haste shall be written, they brought and had left over. And in other words, of my children, of the Jewish people, it, it's written, it's written in the Torah, they brought so much there was left over. But of the Nesim who had delayed, their name will be spelled with a missing Yud. Shame on you that you had to wait, that you didn't show alacrity, that you didn't show the zrizus, a uh, desire to get it done, the desire to give, the desire to donate like the Jewish people did, right? Um, okay, um, therefore they hesitated to donate, but again, so the, they, were puni- they, they were punished. Um, now, according, uh, according to this, accordingly, really, remember we talked, when we talked about the, the clothing of the Kohen Gadol, we said that the, the breastplate stones uh, were also, it, it was a judgment, but uh, you could also say that it was, the stones were used in the breastplate of the high priest because it was near his heart and it would atone for the sin of pride, uh, um, of which the, these Nisim gave us an example of pride. So you might ask the question here, really, why is this a negative thing? Okay, fine, they didn't jump to do it. But they're basically saying, look, whatever you need, we're going to give. Whatever is deficient, we're going to give. It, it, it shows a an, an willingness to, to, do, to do your part, and really even more than your part, to say, we'll do whatever is necessary. Whatever shortfall you have, we're going to make it up, right? And in, in fact, they did end up donating very expensive materials, right? So what, what's the flaw in their approach? Why is it a flaw? Why, 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 is, it a, why is it problematic to say, we're going we're gonna to make up the shortfall? So you, you might say that in any endeavor, the key to success, you have two elements that you need. You need skill, right? You need uh, potential, a talent, but you also need perseverance, motivation, right? So which would you think is more important? Well, Talent is important for sure. You need to have the ability to do something. If I if I want to climb a mountain, I've got to have the muscles, right? Um, but in another way, you might say that motivation is really the thing that gets it done, right? Because talent without the motivation is not going to get you anywhere. Right? If I have the muscles but I don't want to climb the mountain, I'm not going to climb that mountain. However, if I don't have the muscles but I have the motivation, right? If I'm really motivated, we can, you can do anything. You, you'll, you'll learn it. You'll, mm-hmm. you'll power through it. You'll figure out another way to do it. You'll get the materials you need, right? So rut's own will, desire to do something, is more powerful than ability to do something. So here's the, the, the volunteers that, that brought stuff and the volunteers that did the work of the Mishkan. The, you know, every, quote unquote, every man whose heart inspired him, they may not have had the talent to do it, but they were so motivated that they became qualified. Somehow they were able to do it. And this is what Hashem is asking of us. In our daily lives, this is what Hashem wants, right? He doesn't say, show me your, the talents that you have. Bring to me what, you know, uh, your great abilities in learning or your great abilities in, uh, I don't know, whatever. Hashem says, show me you're motivated. Show me that you just want to try that's what's important to Hashem. Show me you're willing to try. You can't say entire Shemona Esrei because you don't know Hebrew that well. Say one of the prayers. Or open your heart and, and, your, and your mouth and speak English and say, God, I can't do this today, but I'm going to just pray to you this, you know, for five minutes. I want to. That's what Hashem wants to see from us. So, so they ask the heads of the tribes, what will you be contributing? And they go, whatever. You know, whatever you need. I, I don't know. Whatever you need. I, I'm not sure what we... I don't know. I, we have plenty of stuff. Well, you, you let us know. Right. So they're not showing a motivation, right? They're showing the ability, but they're not showing the motivation. So it's very nice. It's nice to know what you're capable of, but they should have demonstrated that when there's a call to action, it's not time to talk about what you can do. It's time to show that you're willing to do. And so they should have been the first in line, not the last in line, to take that initiative, to be diligent. So, again, that's why they had that missing yud there. Okay.
There's an yeah, interesting... Like another thing that, that we wrote down on here, because it's seeing didn't have the electrical power and the power and the other side. That's one thing that Diana said in there, because her, she's a reader. I mean, I just... I right. A little side thing like that. Right. Mm -hmm, it can, and and that's another reason, a, another good reason, because they they are the models, supposed to be the models for the whole community. Now, in this case, it doesn't seem to have affected the Jewish people. The Jewish which people, is which is, which is good, which is a very good thing. But it is a, a, another reason why you could say they're diminished in the Torah with, it, with their with their word, with their the Hebrew word. They're diminished because you are the leaders, and you are supposed to be the first ones, and you are supposed to be setting a good example. Yeah. That immediately yeah, absolutely. Right, right, right. And there's more praise that's given to the Jewish people. It says in verse 29, Every man and woman whose heart inspired them to generosity to bring for all the work that the Lord had commanded to make brought a gift for the Lord. So they they were, they, you know, the, the Pusik seems to be repeating itself really here. Because it says, it says every man and woman whose heart inspired them and then it ends with they brought. Okay, so we know they brought. They 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 were heart inspired them to bring, and they brought. This seems like a little repetitious. So you could maybe interpret this to mean every every man or woman whose heart moved them to bring themselves. They were really putting themselves into this project, right? They brought them their own selves there. It wasn't just a technical donation. It was, and we talked a little bit about this also. Uh, was it last week or a couple of weeks ago when we said that? Um, that you know the the donations for the um, for the for the Mishkan it was a few weeks ago. It was about what was inside them. It was what they personally wanted. That that the building of the Mishkan was a gift from their their hearts and their souls, which is why Hashem loved it so much, and is why it, it was such a significant place. They were basically saying, like, we, when we beautify Shabbos, as we said before, Shabbos is a sanctuary in time that's meant to be dedicated to Hashem. When we beautify Shabbos with beautiful tablecloth and foods and clothing, we are um, basically saying we're giving of ourselves to make this a holy day for Hashem. And in the same way, this is what the Jewish people did. Um, uh, and, you know, there were also people who didn't have all the gold and silver that other people might have. And so they, they had a little bit here, but they still donated it from their heart. So it's not, again, it's not how much you do, it's not what you're able to do, it's the motivation that counts, and that's, what, um, that's what's important. The Lubavitcher Rebbe explains something interesting. He says, you know, among the materials that Moshe asked for were gold, silver, and copper. And he says they are symbolic or representative of different types of Jewish people. So the gold might be considered tzaddik. That's the highest level of metal, let's say, a righteous individual. Silver um, could be, let's say, a balchuva, someone who wasn't, who wasn't uh, close to Hashem and then returned to God. Uh, and copper is the least expensive metal. This is a sinner. So the Rebbe says you may, you may think that really... Materials should only be brought from gold, from the mo most important thing, right? I mean, copper, why would God want a lowly metal in his, in his building, in his house, right? You, you want the best materials. But um, again, uh, or you might say, okay, gold and silver. The Baal Shuva took something that was, you know, not holy and he turned himself into, you know, he, he climbed a ladder. But the Torah is teaching us that even the sinner must be included in this endeavor. Like every Jewish person, every Jewish person has a value, has something to give. And we shouldn't discount, we shouldn't think they, no, they shouldn't give. You know, and the material, that, that, that's represented in the materials, right? Um, so everybody has something to contribute and God wants to see those contributions even from a sinner. Right, so that's an important lesson there. Now, let's get to the... To, uh, what I think is a fascinating uh, uh, sort of uh, theme here, which is the women. Because okay, the women are mentioned a few times in this Parsha. So we're focusing again on the part of the Parsha that just deals with the donations to the Mishkan. Okay, so I want you to look at, um, right, so in verses 4 to 9, right, so Moshe speaks to the community, uh, take from yourselves, collect from among yourselves, uh, 
offerings. Uh, every person will bring it, and these are the materials, right? Now, from yourselves is very interesting, and it's a word, a phrase, that harkens back to the golden calf and the women, the women's role there. Now, remember what we said. The women did not contribute their jewelry, right? Aharon had told them, go take the, the jewelry off of, the earrings off of your wives and your children, because he was trying to delay, and he figured the women didn't want to give. He was right for a different reason. They, you know, he, he Aharon thought they didn't want to give because what woman wants to give up her little pretty little shiny trinkets? They didn't give because they didn't want to be part of such a thing, right? So here, so when it came to giving a donation of the golden cap, the women didn't give their earrings, right? The men gave their own earrings. It says that they took the earrings off of their own ears and they gave them to Aharon, right? That was uh, a sin, right? They, they're donating their own things for the golden calf. Here, Moshe says, from yourselves, meaning now this this giving has to be from your own things to atone for the last giving of your own things. Right? The, for the golden calf, you brought your own stuff. Well, now make sure to bring your own stuff, not your wife's stuff, <laughs> not your kid's stuff, your things. That's what you donated for the sin. Now you're going to donate your things for the good, right? Okay. Um, Moshe is also, also kind of saying another reason for take your stuff is let's be quick about it. Remember, Aharon had, to, had wanted to delay them by saying get other people's things. Moshe is here saying your stuff is quicker, right? You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to ask where is it. You don't have to beg for it. Bring your things. Okay. Now we come to a very interesting pasuk, verse 22. Take a look at that. Verse 22, it says... Vayavohu anashim al hanashim. The men came with the women, or literally, the men came on the women, which we'll get to in a minute. But the, basically, is a, we translate this as the men came with the women. Every generous-hearted person brought bracelets and earrings and rings and buckles, all kinds of golden objects, and every man who waved a waving. Okay, so what is the connotation of that phrase? The men came with the women. What does it say to you? Correct. That's the uh, the understanding of the commentators of the rabbis that uh, that it means that the women came first and the men were tagging along with the women. So what are, what are we learning here? The women were had more alacrity. They took off the jewelry and they brought it right away. Right. They were first. They brought their clasps, their pendants, their rings, the gold things, as, as it says right here. Their earrings, their bracelets, the rings, the buckles, all kinds of gold stuff. And when the men arrived, they found the women had already brought their contribution. This is a great tribute to the women. Again, continuing the theme that the women were the righteous ones, right? They had previously refused to give to the golden calf, right? And now they are continuing to show their goodness. They want to give. Now, this also proves, by the way, <coughs> that their stinginess last time was not because they wanted to hold on to their jewelry, because they were stingy, because they were selfish, etc. You could make that argument just from the text, right? All the text says was the women wouldn't give the jewelry. It doesn't say why, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't say why. Right. And um, so you could argue, well, <laughs> who, what woman wants to give up her earrings? No, no, this is coming to show you they were the first ones. And so they're giving here. Why? Because this is a good cause. They didn't give there. Why? Because that was a bad cause. Right? Um, so it's not, not an issue of cl closed fist fistedness here. Okay. The Kliyakar adds something interesting. He says, the women's greatness is proven even more here. Because we know that the tabernacle was an atonement for the, gold, for the sin of the golden calf. The women had not been involved in that sin, so they really weren't required to give anything, right? Uh, additionally, additionally, Moshe said, whoever wants to give can give. But they didn't need atonement at all, but they decided to give anyway, right? Um, okay, so here again we see the women showing the way with faith, right? They're leaders of the community when it comes to faith. 
they came forward again here. They said, come on, we have to give. We have to. They were the first ones to do it. They, we can't dwell on the negative. There has to be a rebirth. We have to go on. This is the unique attribute of the women. They did it in, they demonstrated this in Egypt. When they, uh, and we're going we're gonna to explain later about uh, where it says about the, uh, they contributed their mirrors. Uh, they did it in Egypt where they showed tremendous hope for the future. Tremendous trust in God that he would, was going to keep his word and take them out. They showed the hope with the golden calf where they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And they're showing it here with the Mishkan. Okay. Now, we learned uh, that the reward for not participating in the, the, the sin of the golden calf was that the women received the holiday of Rosh Chodesh. Remember that, right? When did that take effect? So one of the uh, commentators says that they received this holiday at this time of the building of the Mishkan because, uh, because they had distinguished themselves through the donation of their jewelry. That, in, that it, the Mishkan was dedicated on Rosh Chodesh, Nisan, and, when, and, and it's specifically this particular month that was given to them as holiday. Uh, the Das Akenim theorizes that really the holiday of Rosh Chodesh as a general holiday was given to women, but it started originally it was supposed to be just Rosh Chodesh Nisan because uh, a reminder of uh, or a, a, a representation of their, um, their uh, involvement in this mitzvah of bringing the jewelry. Okay. Now we come to verse 25 and 26. Let's take a look at that. Verse 25, 26 says, uh, And every wise-hearted woman spun with her hands, and they brought spun material, blue, purple, crimson, wool, and linen. So let's see what else we're told about the women here. We learned something else. So you might have a question on the Pasuk, right? Something seems to be a little bit unnecessary here. Um... Every wise woman spun with her hands. You could ask, why is it necessary to say with her hands? It should be enough to say every wise woman spun, <laughs> right? Every wise woman spun or they brought spun material. It's kind of understood that spinning is done with the hands. So why, why point that out? Meaning what? She didn't have her hand ready for it. Very good. Yes. Exactly the point, that the, you, there are some women who, let's say, can teach other women how to spin, but they're not really expert themselves, or they would have somebody else do it for them. No, they did it themselves, exactly. It is the praise of the women that they involve themselves hands-on, literally hands-on, to show that because they wanted to do the, the, the effort. They wanted to, do, to make the effort themselves. They knew what reward it was, it was, what, you know, they had dedication. That's why. Now, this is contrasted to the men. Let's see what the men says did. It's in verse 23. And every man with whom was found blue, purple, or crimson wool, right? They brought them. Doesn't say they made them. They brought them. And, and he, every, in other words, every man who ha happened to have with him, every, every man, man with whom was found. Every man, they, oh, I have a piece of wool. There, I'll bring it. He didn't do it with his hands. He didn't make it. You know, typically men wouldn't know how to do this, but, they, you know, they would. They, they might they might learn. They didn't try to learn from the women. They didn't try to learn from B'Tzalel or from Moshe. They, whatever I find, oh, look, I found this thing in my closet. Okay, I'll bring it. So it's showing a, a much different level of dedication to this mitzvah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Wise-hearted woman also indicates something. Right, wise-hearted woman, the chal isha chachmas lev, wise-hearted, very interesting phrase here, that indicates something about their halachic knowledge, actually something about what they knew, their wisdom. So the law is, this is, this is a commentary from the May Amloes, the law is that a woman, when a, when a woman marries a man, everything she owns becomes his, right? And whatever work she does becomes his. Okay, so that's, uh, and we've talked about, uh, when we talked about marriage, we talked about how a, a man or woman can decide she's not going to take any of his support, and she's going to keep her own money, and that's fine. And there's all kinds of financial agreements that they can make between themselves like this. So, again, so any anything that she would spin would become her husband's, right? Uh, here, 
the women, the wise women who knew halacha, said to their husbands, we don't want your support. We want to do our own work because that way I'm able to donate what I own. It's mine. It's not yours. I want to give it of myself. So I am, I am now saying to you, um, I know the law. I know, I know what it means to give wool that, that we own. It's really what you own. I want to give it of myself. So I'm now separating my work, my handiwork. It's going to be my pro the product of my labor, and therefore I will own it. And they also kind of knew they, that they didn't really need their husband's per permission for another reason. The, so the Gemara says that, that uh, the, this law, that a woman has to give what she works and produces to her husband, is because he is obligated to support her. Right? He has the obligation to provide sustenance for her. Um, and so therefore she has to give what she produces to him. Now, in the wilderness, right, the wilderness, Hashem fed everybody. The sustenance came directly from above with the man that came down every morning. Therefore, halacha here doesn't apply. It's not the husbands that are giving the sustenance, it's God. Therefore, I'm going to give this from me because I know this is my, the fruits of my labor, my fruits. So, okay. Now, we have another little puzzlement in the Pasuk in 25. Okay. It's very interesting. Okay, it says like this. I'm going to read the Hebrew because the Hebrew has uh, it. Um, it has a number to the verb that English does it. Um, the chol isha and every woman. So that's singular, right? Chachma slave who was wise hearted, biadeha with her hands tavu. They spun. Tavu is a plural verb. They spun. So now we have a, a, a little bit of a problem here that the, the verb and the noun don't agree in number. One woman, they spun. Right? Little, why? It's a little, it should say, uh, tava, tava, she, she spun, but it's tavu. So we, um, we answer that by saying that it was divine assistance here that, that was the second partner and what the women spun. That as soon as the woman would take the, the wool to spin it, Hashem would spin it together with them, right? And this actually harkens back to what we said when we were talking about earlier about the motivation. When Hashem, Hashem wants from us is, the, is to see the effort. Hashem wants from us to see motivation. You're motivated to do it, you wanna do it, you wanna try, show me you're trying, then I'm gonna help. That's what we say, is that we, we have to make the effort Hashem kicks in and says, I'm going to help you do it. Okay. Here, that's what, what was happening. So they, show, they showed a love and devotion for God that they wanted to do so, so much of so, this so much that Hashem kicked in, as it were. Okay. Um, and um, and that, that, it, that it would, they would, Hashem caused it to be spun by itself. In other words, it went, the, job, the work went very easily, very, very easily. Okay, now we come to another very odd Pasuk. 26. Kal Hanashem and all the women, Asher Nasa Liban Osana the Chachma, whose hearts uplifted them with wisdom, Tavu Es Haizim, they spun, now the translation is not correct again, but they are translating according to, um, they're, they're adding a little bit of logic, okay? The, the Hebrew says, they spun the goats. They spun the goats, meaning the goat hair. Okay, but the words are important, as we know. They spun the goats. What do you mean they spun the goats? <laughs> what is, why not say spin the goat hair? So the Talmud says that they, it, it, they actually used a very interesting technique to spin the goat hair. Uh, quote from the Talmud. This was an extraordinary craftsmanship, for they would spin them from the fleece on the back of the goat before it was shorn. This, in other words, and Rashi explains that this required a tremendous craftsmanship. They would actually spin the hair while it was on the goat. So why on earth would they do that? The, 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 how they did that, I don't know. I guess the goat, the goat must have had a tremendous coat already. Like very, very right, goats. exactly. Very easy going. Right, right, that too, that too. Right, it, it requires, Rashi says, it requires an extra Amazing. craftsmanship, omnis yisera, a special 
craftsmanship talent that I have no idea how they would do that. Anyway, so the question is why do it this way, right? Why would you do it this way? And there are a few answers. The Sparno explains like this, that when you, when you cut goat's hair off of a goat's body, so the, the, the hair loses its luster, a lot of its luster. That naturally when it's on the goat, it has a certain, certain luster that is lost once you shear it off. And by combing and spinning it while it was still growing, it didn't lose that luster. That's one thing. So, <clears throat> again, you know, this, this wasn't part of the command. They just loved, they wanted to do this, you know, this work to the best of their ability. They wanted to present the best material they possibly could. And so they did it this way. That they, 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 they said, this is, the, this is how we're going to do it because this is for the, the beauty of the, of the, of the tabernacle. Um, there's also another reason that explains that it was important to keep the threads clean, right? You wanted to present something clean. So in order to keep them as clean as possible, not, you know, we, we're not going to cut them off first, which would risk some of them falling on the floor or uh, some of them being soiled um, in a, w with something else. So <clears throat> we'll thread it right when it's on the, the goat. It's, I know it's clean on the goat. It's not, it hasn't been on the floor, hasn't been anywhere dirty. It'll keep cleaner that way. Um, this was also a way, as I said, for them to show the love of the mitzvah, right? Um, because even though, you see, they were working with very, think about it, they're working with very lowly materials. Goat hair is not gold or silver or precious gems or spices. This is goat hair, right? This, and, and furthermore, this goat hair was used as the intermediate sheets that were going to be covering the walls and the ceiling of the Mishkan, right? So there were like three layers of, of curtains. The goat hair curtains would go in between. Out The outer ones and the inner ones would be fancier, right? Would be, you know, blue, uh, made from the tachash, animal, burgundy. These are much more um, expensive, precious materials. The goat's hair is going in between. So it's not like they needed to, uh, to put all this effort in right? Why take so much trouble to put such effort in just to create something that's not going to even be seen, right? So um, the Zohar says that um, you can really, you can divide the people who gave to the, uh, to donated to the Mishkan into three categories. There were people who were very wealthy, they had a lot of great materials, but they had no craftsmanship, no talents, and the Pasuk alludes to them uh, when it says Isha Nimsa, it was found. In other words, these are the men that have the materials. They brought what they had. They didn't do any work, right? The second category is people who had materials and also had talent. So they donated their work, but they also worked at wi spinning or weaving or, you know, uh, constructing the wooden pieces for the Mizbeach. Whatever they, they were able to do, they also contributed their talents, right? Um, but then you had the third category of people, and the women who made the, who were spinning the goats were of this category. They really had no, uh, they didn't have any wealth, right? But they had talent. So they had nothing precious. They had a goat, and they had a, uh, a loom, let's say. All they could contribute was their talent, basically. So that even, even though it's something less expensive than the, the more expensive materials, they uh, were motivated, again, by, by the love of Hashem. They, they wanted to make that effort, right? Um, and so and it's, it's interesting because the Pasuk does describe, in this Pasuk that we just looked at, it describes two different kind of women. Um, there's wise-hearted women that brought the different colored wools. These are the wealthy and women, right? But then you also have the second class of, of people who wove the goats, right? So you had two different levels of, of donation, different kinds of, of, of women. They, they, could, they, could do, they could do nothing but, 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 um, but, but spin the goats, right? And so as we said before, right, when, when, you are, when you are able to do something, that's great. So when I have riches that I can donate, that's fine, that's wonderful. But when I have the desire, right, that's 
that's a more, that's a higher level because I am motivated much more, right? So here it actually hints to that because it's in 26, it says, all the, women's whose heart, all the women whose hearts uplifted them with wisdom. In other words, the fact that, that the very fact that they are motivated in this mitzvah, shown by the, the way that they're just spinning the, the wool on the goats, uplifts their hearts. That alone, in other words, that fact alone, that they are um, dedicated so much to this difficult task of spinning wool on animals, that uplifts their hearts. That is what's raising them to the next level of donor. The women who bring, in 25, the women who bring and even spin with their hands the materials of, of the more expensive materials, right? Uh, so they have the more expensive materials and they're spinning, great. They have the materials and they're motivated, but they're not as motivated as the women who have only the goats. They were uplifted. Those hearts, their, their hearts were uplifted. Um, so that's, um, yeah. So they, they, you know, they wanted to bring any tools they could use. Um, the the Lubavitcher Rebbe has an interesting insight here. Why, another reason why they, they did it on the goats. So they, so the women knew, the righteous women, the, these wise hearted women, they knew that in the temple, there were two levels of uh, offerings. One would be uh, meal sacrifices like, you know, uh, flour and, and things like that. And the other would be animals. The animal offerings were on a higher level. The women wanted to give the highest level offering. They wanted an animal sacrifice. So this was their way of contributing an animal sacrifice, as it were, by spinning the wool on the goats. Okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, okay, ba, ba, ba. Oh, and the next... So in the next Pasuk, right? The very next Pasuk, after we talk about the women that spun the goats, we mention the Nisim. The princes, <laughs> what did they bring? And so we said, so they, so here we're comparing, again, whatever the Torah juxtaposes two subjects or two sentences or two ideas, we always say why. There's a reason for the placement of everything. Here, we have a very poignant and instructive juxtaposition between these women whose hearts uplifted them who had nothing except their talents to spin goat hair versus the, the princes who, even though they brought the most expensive items, the stones, they, their name is missing a yud. Hashem says, not as good as the women. Sorry, you didn't show me that you wanted it. You had none of the motivation at, that the women showed. You had none of the desire that the women showed. Yeah, you have the materials, great, but there's something missing because you didn't jump to it the way the women did. And so that's why the juxtaposition here of the women with the Nassim. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, shall we end here? Or shall we continue with just one more more issue here of the mirrors. I'd like to I just just very briefly. Yeah. So in in um, chapter oh I didn't I didn't print it out though. In chapter thirty eight eight uh, verse eight it says he made the copper washstand meaning Betzalel Moshe made the washstand and the copper base. It says he made the made it out of the mirrors of the legions who congregated at the entrance of the communion tent. So this is a labor, meaning the, the wash basin from which the priests, the Kohanim, would wash themselves before doing any work. And he made them out of the mirrors of the women, right? We talked about, um, uh, now, legions means these women. They, and it says in the Muslim, they would congregate at the entrance of the communion tent. In other words, they would gather together at the entrance of the Mishkan. They wanted to stay there and listen to the Torah or just be near the Mishkan. They were very dedicated women. Um, they, they, the Ibn Ezra says they they were done with their mirrors. You know, right? They they didn't want to have anything to do with 
the the nonsense of beautifying themselves or they didn't want to have anything to do with you know that sort of activity they're putting that activity away they donated the mirrors and what did they do instead they stood at the entrance of the mishkan to hear words of torah so they were giving up the things of the world in order to focus on spirituality really um now, uh, uh, and, and the word that's used is armies. And, and, okay, we can go on. But remember, these mirrors were the ones that Moshe said, I, can't, I don't want to accept them because they're used for vanity. Hashem says to Moshe, take these mirrors because these mirrors are more, inval- more valuable to me than all the other gifts. Why? Because the mirrors were used in Egypt to, to build armies. And that's why the word here is used armies because the, with these mirrors... The women raised armies. What does that mean? So in, amidst, in the midst of the very backbreaking labor that the Jewish men uh, were doing uh, in Egypt, the women would go out to them with their mirrors and they would seduce their husbands, right? By looking in the, holding the mirror up and saying to their husbands, I am more beautiful than you are. And they would seduce their husbands through, the, through using the mirrors. As a result, they built great armies of the Jewish people um, and so they, they, again, were showing their faith in Hashem. They were showing the not giving up, not being depressed, not despairing. And this is why Hashem says, these mirrors are so precious to me. And as a result, it's going to be used in the device, right, the washstand, which was used <coughs> later on to prove the innocence of a wife who was accused of infidelity. The, the waters of the Sota, the Isha Sota, right? The accused woman. The, mirror? mm-hmm. the mirrors, uh, the copper, basically they were, they were sheets of copper. Mm-hmm. And they, they were hammered out. They didn't have actual glass mirrors. Then they used copper. So they were made into the copper washstand. Mm-hmm. Now, very interesting fact what here. So, right, so Hashem is saying these devices, the mirrors that were made to... Were, were used to make the, the washstand, they are so precious to me because the Jewish women showed through them their trust in me, right? They're so important because they built the nation of Israel in Egypt. Therefore, these mirrors are going to be used in, a, in the washstand, which will later be used to again be, bring peace between a husband and wife. They were originally used for that purpose, to bring peace between a husband and wife, to make uh, to sh- shalom bias peace in the home. Now, later on, when the Isha Sota, the, acu- the woman who was accused of infidelity, right? Mm-hmm. The, when she's brought to the uh, Beis HaMikdash or the Mishkan, uh, her husband says, I, I, I believe you've been uh, disloyal, you committed adultery. Yeah. They bring her to the Mishkan or the, the Beis HaMikdash. She is made to drink water from that washstand. Mm-hmm. And the water, which is going to have a piece of paper in it that is uh, that dissolves in the water that says the name of Hashem, so it's going to be imbued with a certain power there. Wow. She's going to drink it, and if she is guilty, she's going to die. But if she's innocent, it's going to be a method to bring the two of them together again. The husband is going to see that she's innocent. They're going to be blessed with children, and it'll be a good uh, you know, uh, it'll promote peace between them. So that's what Hashem is saying. Because the women in Egypt use the mirrors for peace and for growth and for trust and for faith in me, I want this washstand to be made of these mirrors, and eventually it's going to have the purpose to, to bring the women together, the, together with the husband. Now, very la- on the very last point here, there's no, uh, all the, the kalim, all the utensils and the furniture of the Mishkan of the tabernacle had very specific dimensions to it, right? It has to be so high and so wide, and you, right? Even the, the pegs of the wooden, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, pieces that went to building the walls, they all had dimensions. The only thing that doesn't have dimensions is not listed as, as how big it's supposed to be is the washstand. Why? Because Hashem said, Every mirror has to fit. I don't know how big it's going to be, but he wants every mirror donated from the women, again, because they're so valuable to God, every mirror has to go into that washstand. 
That's how valuable they were. So therefore, you can't give a, a d dimension because let's say you have a little left over. Then you're going to just not use it? No, 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 no. Or, or you know, so, or let's say he, he wanted, Hashem wanted all the mirrors that were donated by the women to be used in the wash tent. So therefore, there's no dimensions given for it. Is a des the description of how it should look or whatever, but not how big it should be. Again, because let's say you have too many. He didn't want any of them going to waste. That's how precious they were. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you yeah. so much.